All praise is due to Allah, the one who deserves to be praised. And we, we bear witness that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah. And He is alone in His divinity and He has no partners. And He is the protector of those who believe. And we bear witness that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is his slave and his messenger. We ask Allah to exalt his mention and grant him peace and send his blessings and salutations upon him and upon his companions and his wives and all those who follow them on their path of righteousness until the day of judgment. As to what follows, when it comes to self-development and self-management, you will find a tremendous amount of people or what they call coaches involved in this field everybody has something to say about the self-development how to become a better person how to manage your time how to manage your talents how to capitalize on opportunities how to get out of the rat race that has to do with having a job you know where you have a manager or someone tells, telling you what to do, when to do it and how to do it from this time till that time and how do you start your own business and so on and so forth I mean it's a very broad topic uh, I kindly ask the sisters to limit any discussions while the lecture is going on it's, uh, I get distracted easily it's, it's my fault um, but the thing that we notice, obviously, whenever this, whenever this topic is addressed by whoever is, is doing the job, more likely than not, what Islam has to say about this is usually overlooked. Meaning it is given from a very worldly, limited perspective. And if you were to follow uh, strictly whatever uh, directions you're given or ideas that are suggested then you might find yourself actually in a danger zone and you will see that it will not work at least it will not work in the context of the hereafter you might successfully manage the dunya but that does not mean that you will successfully manage the life to come and needless to say, but we have to say it because we all need reminders. We're here for the life to come. We get distracted. We lose focus. We immerse ourselves in worldly pleasures. We do what we do. And then Allah Azza wa Jal has His ways to remind us where the focus should be. And so it's our job to remind one another about the ultimate objective, the ultimate goal, the ultimate prize. It is to be protected from the hellfire and admitted to paradise. Nothing else matters. No matter how much we speak about it, indulge in it, elaborate on it, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. So when we speak about self-development or as the title of the lecture is, A Better Me, a better version of me, an enhanced, optimized, advanced, improved, you know, digital, I guess, version of myself, yourself, everybody. We would like to address some of those ideas that are often used and promoted about self-development and time management and what have you, but we want to look at them with the proper foundation and then the application of the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu in all of that. Secondly, we must understand that the objective of the self-development and self-management has to be in the light of the overall condition of the ummah. It is not a solo project. It is not something that one does without taking into consideration the needs of the ummah at that time and that is very important when it comes to the discussion of where you're channeling your energy where you're placing your focus something that in terms of return on investment is pretty much beneficial for you but it doesn't 
incorporate what the Muslims need at that point. You may have a potential in certain field that is more beneficial to the Muslims than what you're doing. That is something that we have to consider as well. And that is one of our roles as a member of this community and a member of the Ummah. Anyways, the summary of self-management and self-development is often said to be the ability for an individual to channel his feelings, thoughts and capabilities towards certain goals that he sets for himself. Because obviously you will come across many obstacles and distractions and humps and you need to overcome those successfully. Otherwise they will prevent you from moving. If they prevent you from moving then that's just failure. Failure does not mean that we give up. Failure is part of the path. It's part of the process. One must fail for one to become better. That's why the Prophet ﷺ said that every son of Adam is sinful. And the best of those who sin are those who repent. In a hadith Qudsi, Allah Azza wa said, if, he, if we didn't sin, if we didn't dis disobey Allah, Allah would have replaced us with another people who would disobey Him. Then seek forgiveness so He would forgive them. That's just part of the cycle. The relationship between the slave and his Lord is one where you will sin, repent, rectify, and improve. You can't be on a level of perfection throughout. That's why when you read the Quran from cover to cover, and I hope we get to do this in Ramadan, inshallah, if we all remain alive and healthy. When you read the Quran from cover to cover, I advise myself and you to look into the matter meticulously. The objective is not, I did a khatma of the Quran, I, I finished it once or twice, or I prayed the Laylatul, supposedly Laylatul Qadr behind the Imam of the Haram, uh, you know, on the 27th in Mecca. Those are all logistics. Those are all external matters. And with all honesty, they may or may not be of value. Allah Azza wa Jal is not looking at those. That's why the hadith, Allah doesn't look at the outside. Not that the outer appearance doesn't matter, but Allah looks at the condition inside. So perhaps a person praying taraweeh, you know, sincerely in some local masjid, somewhere where it doesn't have all the, the means and the privilege to be in the haram, in the sight of Allah, the condition of his heart and his and his khushu and submissiveness and humbleness is superior to uh, the 10,000 people in the haram. And I'm saying this because I don't want us to focus on I finished the Quran. How often have we finished the Quran? Maybe many times. Some of you, mashallah, finish it successfully every Ramadan twice. Hypothetically. Hypothetically, twice every Ramadan for the last 10 years. That's 20 times. Dis disregarding whatever you do throughout the year. Not in Ramadan. Yet, if we were to ask the average Muslim, what, what lessons have you learned from the stories of the prophets? Maybe some will just be able to enumerate the prophets. And not all of them. They will remember something about Dawood, something about Sulaiman, something about Musa, something about Ibrahim alayhi salam. But how many would be able to tell you that, that whatever good and bad was mentioned? You will find that almost for every prophet, there's an incident that shows weakness, human weakness, in spite of being a prophet. And that what saved that person, that prophet, what, what brought him success and salvation was Tawheed. Every one of them had done something. A prophet of Allah. And this is not by any means to belittle them. Law Allah. Who are we to belittle the prophets? But Allah mentioned them in the Quran. If Allah wanted to give us a perfect, a perfect image of the prophets, then Allah would have only mentioned, mentioned whatever good happened. We wouldn't have the incidents of Musa alayhi salam having killed someone, even before. Or Ibrahim lying about the aliha, that this kabiruhum, is this the one who destroyed the other ones? Or Yunus leaving his people and being swallowed by the whale. And Dawood alayhi salam, when two people came to, for a judgment, he heard one, one person who told him, I have 99 uh, goats or whatever animal similar to that, and my brother has only one, so he asked me to take one. He said, he oppressed you by asking you that. 
And then Allah Azza wa Jal, uh, you know, reprimanded him for not having heard the other side. And Sulaiman, when he was busy with his horses, until the time of Salah came, the dhikr, according to some of the scholars, the adhkar of the masa, and as a retaliation, he ordered that all these horses are brought and he slaughtered them because they, they distracted him from the remembrance of Allah. Even the Prophet wasallam, when he frowned and he turned away from Al-A'ma, from the blind man. That's because it's, a, it's an establishment of the reality of the son of Adam. So in the process of trying to reach our goals, we must fail. The difference between a failure and another is a destructive failure or a constructive failure. And any one of us can choose to make a failure destructive. Those are the suicidal people. Or the people that allow any kind of calamity or problem or something to completely ruin their life. And constructive is one where you pick yourself up and you move on. So, failure is part of the process. Embrace it. If you have the right tools, if you apply the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, then you can turn any situation into something good. This, the, the incidents that happened with Aisha radiallahu anha. No, no husband would want this for his wife. And this is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and, and his beloved wife, Umm al-Mu'mineen, Aisha radiallahu anha wa ardaha. The story of the ifk, the slander and the story that they came up with. In spite of the evil that, that you know, appears from the story, the benefits that we get from this incident until now are uncountable. You cannot enumerate them. How many lessons and guidelines were set in Islam because of this incident? And how that made Aisha anha stronger? And how she became a pillar? In a sense that she, at some point, whatever person's belief about Aisha determines whether he's a believer or a disbeliever. His stance versus Aisha is that significant. And that gave her more of importance in the ummah that Allah revealed Quran in reference to her and when Quran is revealed in reference to you that's a big deal man when you're you're the subject of a discussion of Rabbul Alameen that's it that's, there's nothing beyond that so this is the correct understanding of the concept of a possible failure and how to deal with it so let us ask the first major question. The first major question is this self-development of mind, this self-rectification, this self-management, is it in line with the ultimate objectives of the ummah or not? This question can or cannot be answered. What do you guys think? Can I answer this question right now? I know the morning time is rough. I know. I know it's a Saturday too. You would be relaxing in bed, I don't know what, doing what, sleeping some more maybe, or just, just relaxing. So it's tough to be uh, lectured on a Saturday morning. That said, I'm still going to give you a hard time. Can I answer this question? Can I answer the question on behalf of each one of you whether your objectives are in line with the objectives of the Islamic Ummah? No, because I don't know what you're doing. <laughs> I don't know what you're doing. I don't know what your objectives are. I don't know what you've considered and you have not considered. So that question, if I were to ask each one of you, then you would give me an answer. We can have a discussion afterwards and tell you, you know, assuming I'm an advisor, I would tell you this and that, possibly. But generally speaking, no. But that said, you don't need anybody to tell you that. This is something that you can assess and figure out on your own. What we do want is to do it. We want to give it that thought. Whatever objectives you've set for yourself, make sure that you're looking at them in the context of the current affairs. In the context, I know this is general, but in the context of current affairs because the ummah may need something that you have and you're not using this or you're not utilizing it properly, therefore the ummah is missing out on good that you can offer while you are preoccupied with something else. What exactly is that? No one knows better than you. But in my experience with people, you meet certain brothers, for example, 
who have tremendous potential. MashaAllah, tabarakallah, tremendous potential. But they don't focus on one area. They're actually all over the place. And when you're all over the place, when you don't specialize in a particular field, you miss out. It's nice to be multi-talented and be able to do so many things. That's cool. Nobody's telling you to limit yourself. It's, there's a difference between the two. The more you know in the various fields, the better. But whatever is your point of strength, this is where your investment should be. That's why you should go that extra mile. And don't get distracted in trying to build so many different constructions. Just imagine that you have, uh, you know, 20 years or 30 years of, of life. And you're trying to build eight different constructions. How long would it take you? You might actually pass away before finishing any one of them because you're, you're building equally. You're putting the same foundation here, then the same foundation there. That's eight times. Everything is multiplied by eight. Versus trying to have eight different structures, but then you say, I'm going to focus on one until it's fully built. Then I will shift to the other one. If you had guaranteed time, if one of us had a guaranteed time that you would live for X amount of years, therefore you will be able to build them simultaneously, we would say, okay, go ahead. But nobody has that. And therefore, while you're trying to build all these different talents simultaneously, the Ummah would never benefit from this because you might pass away before you ever produce anything. That's why, find something that you're strong at. Of course, I'm talking about in the context of something that is beneficial for the Ummah. Because one would say, Wallahi, I'm video games, I'm number one in the world. I play FIFA for you know, X amount of hours and I can beat anyone. Say, Zakallah khair, that's beautiful. And? <laughs> What, which part of the Ummah is exactly going to benefit from this? <coughs> Nobody. That's a skill you enjoyed. We're not here to criticize those who want to play FIFA. But that is not what I'm referring to. Just in case somebody's mind is going into their own preferences and their own hobbies. We're not talking about hobbies. We're talking about a, a skill that, that the Muslims can benefit from. An ability that Allah Azza wa blessed you with that you know people around you don't necessarily share with you. Alright, so let's ask a question. And that has been addressed in a previous topic for whose sake. And there's no harm in addressing this again in a different way. When, and I, I'm interested in getting some answers from you, uh, brothers and, and sisters. When you speak about um, self development, are you supposed to do it for your sake or for Allah's sake? Uh huh. Both? Okay, so we have, uh, scholars have differed on the subject matter here. We have one sheikh who says that it's for Allah and another one says <laughs> another one says it's for both. What do you guys think? No, let me hear different opinions. Okay, whoever has an answer, I would like uh, I would like an evidence for it. I made it tough right now, huh? When you say you need evidence, you need Islam, right? Yeah, okay, I'll I'll dismiss that. Give it to give it to me based on your understanding of the text without even knowing the citation. Fair enough. Go back though. Go back. Do you, do you have to intend... Okay, let's say I say I'm going to put a plan where I'm going to fix myself. I'm going to make a better version of myself. When you, when you have that intention, is it because you want to become a better person or because you strictly want to please Allah? Okay, now that's both. Both. Okay, so now you're on the same page. So there's no more difference of opinion. Yes, brother? Uh, both. Okay. That's a fair opinion. So the brother, just in case the camera didn't catch it, he said we have to be both, and he cited an evidence for that. Uh, I don't know if it's applicable, but still he said, "Rabbana atina fi dunya hasan, Allah give us good in this dunya, wa fil akhirati hasan, give us good in the life to come, waqina adabana, and protect us from the uh, torment of the hellfire." Okay, so when we look at the ayah, when we look at the ayah, "Qul inna salati wa nusuki wa mahiyya wa mamati lillahi Rabbi alamin." Say, verily, my prayers, my sacrifices, my living, my life, hayati, my whole life, my existence, if, in other words. وَمَمَاتِ And my death. Lillahi are strictly for Allah, the Lord of the worlds, and He has no partners. That actually is the ultimate foundation. Sure, 
you, the byproduct of you doing this is self-development, no doubt. Because Allah doesn't benefit from these things in the sense that Allah is Al-Ghani. Allah is the absolute As-Samad. He doesn't need anybody's effort. He doesn't need anybody's worship. He doesn't need... No, no, we can do whatever or we can dis disobey Allah or obey Allah Azza wa It does not affect him in any way, shape or form. So who's the, who's the one who will benefit ultimately? Us. But the intention should always be for the sake of Allah. And honestly, that's what differentiates us from non-Muslims. Number one. Number two, number two, you could not have that mindset. But you will miss out on tremendous reward versus the one who has that mindset. Because Allah did give us that free will, right? You could not intend to please Allah. Or you could intend to please Allah as a secondary target. But if you were to intend to please Allah strictly and go by the plan, then this is the most rewarding process you will ever uh, involve yourself in. And so according to the ayah, then we should, we should aim ultimately to do this for the sake of Allah. Because this, this will turn everything you do in the process of reaching there, a ibadah. And we will cite some of the opinions or some of the statements of the scholars in regards to this in particular. Ibn al-Jawzi rahimahullah, Ibn al-Jawzi said, لا تعظن إلا بنية ولا تمشين إلا بنية ولا تأكلنا, ولا تأكلنا لقمة إلا بنية He said, don't give an admonishment except with an intention, as in to please Allah. And don't take a step, don't even walk a step without a niyyah and don't even take a bite. Don't even take a bite, a morsel of food without an intention. Of course, that's next level stuff, right? I know, because of our heedlessness, we might not be actively thinking like that. But that's what made the scholars superior. And that's what we strive, that's what we want to strive for. Even the very bite that they take with the niyyah in a sense that they look at everything as means to please Allah Azza wa Jal. I am, I'm, I'm feeding myself, I'm keeping myself healthy, I'm taking care of myself, whatever you want to call it. This is pleasing to Allah. The steps I'm taking towards my job or towards da'wah or towards whatever you're taking, you have an intention that you're making a better version of yourself because Allah loves that. Allah loves that you, you use the, the blessings He gave you, you utilize the, benefit, the, the blessings He gave you in a manner which is pleasing to Him. That intention is so profound. It's so profound. If we were to accompany it or, or keep it in our company the whole time, your state of mind will completely shift. And we ask Allah Azza to facilitate that for us. So the first thing, we're going to take it now, as they say, bullet points, right? How do you get a better version of yourself? Especially that Ramadan is around the corner, inshallah. Does anyone know how many days before Ramadan? 20? Yeah, do we, we have to wait for the moon sighting, no? Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, there's a couple of days discrepancy, but at least everybody's mind is already on. Our khatib yesterday gave a khutbah about it. I was like, he's excited. You know, usually give a khutbah a week before Ramadan, maybe two weeks before Ramadan. He's already discussing this a month and a few days before, mashallah. So he's, he's on point. But yeah, he, made some, he raised some valid points about... Um, why, why the preparation now is important? Because what happens is, and he gave a very good analogy. He said, let's say your, your tank was on empty, right? Your tank is on empty. And then you start filling it up on, he didn't, he didn't actually give this analogy. I, I'm, I'm twisting it a little bit, but I, I, don't, I don't remember exactly what he said. But let's just say your tank is on empty and you start filling it up on the first day. By the time, because Ramadan goes by so fast, but you don't even get to reach full, right? Before you start depleting and then you go back to empty in no time. And then you say to yourself, wait a second, I didn't really get to benefit from Ramadan, Ramadan the way I intended, so inshallah next year. So he said, if you were to look at the months which precede, which precede Ramadan, like the nafila before Salah, according to the opinion of the scholars, 
You know how you pray the voluntary before Salah and after Salah and they complete the act of worship of Salah? He said, that's why the Prophet ﷺ used to fast a lot in the month of Sha'ban. Aisha mentioned the Prophet ﷺ used to fast so much in the month of Sha'ban. So the scholars say this was a preparation, a spiritual preparation, so that when Ramadan comes around, there's, the shock element is gone. Suddenly you're reading so much Quran, suddenly you're fasting, suddenly you're praying at night, all of this suddenly, suddenly, it takes you a few days to adapt. By the time you adapt, you hear the khatib saying, next week is Eid. And you're like, hey, wait a second, what happened here? Time out. <laughs> Can we go back in time? No, sorry, next year. And we all know that we go through this almost on a yearly basis. So that's why the actual preparation starts now. So that when Ramadan comes, you've like, it's like an engine, you've already warmed it. It's warm, it's ready now, you're just ready for takeoff. And inshallah, we'll be able to see better results accordingly. Type. The most important thing then when it comes to self-development and self-management is actually time management. Maybe that's an area where we all could use some reminders and advice. Um, Ibn al-Jawzi rahimahullah said, if the person looks at the span, his lifespan, let's say hypothetically he lives 60 years. How many of those are spent sleeping roughly? 30 years. Huh? 30, let's say 30 of those are spent sleeping. Maybe a few less. Depends on how, how much you sleep. Some people will say 55. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. Koala bears. Uh, you guys do know the koala bear sleeps for like 22 hours a day. 22 or 23 hours a day. They wake up for one hour, do everything they have to do, then go back to sleep. Yeah, pretty rough. Um, and then 15 of those, okay, so let, now you lost, out of the 60, you lost 30, right? You have 30 left. Of those are 15 years of, you know, being a toddler, being a, until you reach the, the age of puberty and responsibility, those don't count either. So now you're left with actually 15. Of those, how much is spent on eating and drinking and, you know, reproducing and what have you, uh, for the married, of course. Then, you, what, how much time is actually left? Nothing. And so now with whatever amount of time left, everybody's trying to purchase this huge property in Jannah. And so really from the 60 years that we live, if we live 60 years, or let's say 70 years, a very small amount of this time is actually available for, for, for improvement, for bettering the relationship with Allah. A very small amount of time. If you add in the modern days, our lifestyle, then we have a disaster, right? Everything around us right now is, is, is distracting, distracting us from the more, more important things. So now we have even a bigger challenge to be able to focus on the things which will get us closer to Allah Azza wa Jalla and not make us among those who are heedless. So time management is something that we cannot stress enough. It's a reminder for all of us. Time management is, you have, some of us don't work, uh, you know, this chaotic approach doesn't work with them. If you don't put a plan, if you don't have a schedule by which you, uh, you know, adhere, to which you adhere, you will miss out. You know yourself better. There's the extemporaneous approach, this kind of uh, haphazard, you know, spontaneous approach to things that works for some people and doesn't work for the vast majority. For, the, for most of us, you must have a schedule. You must have an allocation of time. In my day, X amount of time is for this and X amount of time is for that, whether it's Quran recitation or memorizing a, a dua from the Prophet ﷺ or working on this project or not project. And I'm telling, from, I'm telling you from experience, when, I, when you don't adhere, when I don't adhere, I'm all over the place. I'm all over the place and nothing gets done. Nothing gets done. You just now, you have a lot, you're behind, way behind trying to catch up. And then you spend your whole life trying to catch up. With no mayonnaise. No one got it. Okay, it's okay. I know, there has to be a lame joke somewhere in the lecture for you to wake up. Tayyip. Secondly, after you manage your time, and so the recommendation is, I'm sure most of you have smartphones because our old phones used to be dumb phones so they had to call the new ones smartphones. Um, use your calendar. Use your calendar to put down what, what you want to do at what part of the day based on your schedule. 
So this is something that Allah facilitated in the sense that these are tools that we have today as human beings that we often don't use for the right purposes. We often use them for the wrong things. This is one thing you could use for the right thing. You have a smartphone, you have a calendar, put something in it. Put something in it and make it binding on you to, to adhere. You know, don't make an oath like some people do that if I don't do this, I'm going to, you know, uh, wind up. They promise Allah something and this is known as nether or vow. Then they spend their whole life fasting three days in order to make up for all the vows that they didn't fulfill. Don't, don't make it hard on yourself, but have a plan. Secondly, avoiding sins. And that's something that we're all heedless about. We don't realize or we don't see the connection between sinfulness and the lack of improvement or the lack of uh, self-development and the reason why we're kind of halted and behind is because of our ways of sinfulness. Uh, Ibn Qayyib, Ibn Qayyib rahimahullah, said in his book Al-Jawab Al-Kafi, he said, Inna min al-athari al-qabihati al-madhmuma lil-ma'asi annaha tu'assiru أنها تعسر أمور المرء فلا يتوجه لأمر إلا ويجده مغلقا دونه أو متعسرا عليه One of the evil, ugly, uh, blameworthy consequences of sinfulness is that it, it, um, تعسر, it makes difficult for you, your affairs It, it Complicates your affairs. There you go. It complicates your affairs. So he doesn't go in any direction except that he finds it closed in his face. And anything that he wants facilitation for, he finds it to be extremely difficult. On the flip side, whoever fears Allah, and whosoever fears Allah, Allah will make a way out for him. So just like Allah facilitates the affair of the one who is mindful of Allah and has taqwa, Allah Azza wa Jal also complicates the affairs of the one who is involved in sinfulness. And so very often, some of us might have the potential to go way far and we ruin it for ourselves with our own sins. Is that an invitation to despair? Sit down. Are we inviting everyone to despair? Is this for you to say, uh, Shaykh, then I ruined it for myself, khalas? No. This is an invitation to repent. Because the door of tawbah, the door of tawbah, when does it end? Who knows? Gargara. Can you translate that for the... Uh, just before death. I mean, just before a person... Before your soul reaches you, your collarbone, right? Can we say that? Okay, just before you die. Yeah, and the, the last, when you know you're going to die, because of course, I mean, we can't speak about the time element, right? We know that uh, uh, Fir'aun, Fir'aun might have uh, made, before you die, maybe you drown, it might take you a minute or so, I don't know. But uh, Fir'aun tried to actually fix things right then and there, the last moment, but it didn't, it didn't fly. What's the other time? There's another condition. When the sun rises from the west. Because when the sun rises from the west, what will happen? Khalas. This, this, is, uh, this is now the, the major signs of Yawm Al-Qiyamah. What you will, people will know for real. At that moment, okay. So, so there's La ilaha illallah. Uh, they, will, they will know there's La ilaha illallah. So those are the two times. Until then, Alhamdulillah. Qul ya ibadi alladheena asrafu ala anfusihim. لا تقنطوا من رحمة الله إن الله يغفر الذنوب جميعا It's beautiful Wallah it's beautiful Say oh my slaves who have transgressed against themselves Do not This is a command from Allah Allah is making it haram for one of us to despair from his mercy لا تقنطوا Don't despair from the mercy of Allah Why? Because Allah forgives all the sins I mean come on Does it get any better than this? Wallah it doesn't get any better than this And when you mix with atheists the more you mix with atheists and you talk to atheists, the more you get to appreciate Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The more you see the, the, the difficulty these people go through, the confusion, the state of confusion they're in, you know, the evil assumptions they have about Allah, and the more you understand Islam, the more you appreciate Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
They're, they're claiming that they have an issue with, with a God who demands worship, a God who, you know, uh, has a law that you have to follow. He gives you do's and don'ts. They, they don't like none of that stuff, right? They just want to be free as if they brought their own self into existence. It's like complete disregard for the one who brought them into existence. They just want to enjoy disregarding the one who gave them what they're enjoying. Ajib, yani ajib, the selfishness. But they don't, when you tell them about this quality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah is, is, is forgiving, Allah is loving, Allah is merciful, Allah has given us an outlet for our shortcomings, you know, and they don't want to see it, you get to appreciate Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alhamdulillah. Because it could be, it could be if Allah wanted to be different, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah could be whatever Allah wants. But Allah chose, kataba ala nafsihi rahma. Allah made it obligatory upon Himself to be merciful. Ajeeb, yani. It's mercy from Allah. And that's why, as mentioned a million times before, and there's no harm because, again, because atheism is now on the rise. And it is achieved by the shaitan making you think that you've done so much damage, you've gone so much off the track that there's no hope for you, and then that's how you start gradually leaving Islam. Whereas we're reminding ourselves publicly in front of everybody. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives. We do mistakes, we get back on track, we move, move, move on with our lives. Thirdly, prioritizing and being wise in the process of doing so. What does that mean? Can someone give me an example from the Quran where we have one person advising another person and they were prioritizing in their advice. I know this is a tough one, but there's no harm in on seeing what, what kind of results we will get. In the Quran, there's a, a few ayat where a person was advising another one and it, it was it focused on priorities. Luqman and his son. Yes. No. But you got it. Bullseye. Luqman. What did Luqman say to son? Who remembers the ayat? Who remembers the ayat? وَإِذْ قَالَ لُقْمَانُ لِبْنِهِ وَهُوَ يَعِذُهُ يَا بُنَيَّ لَا تُشْرِكْ بِاللَّهِ إِنَّ الشِّرْكَ لَظُلْمٌ عَظِيمٌ Then No one, the sisters, no one remembers? No, that's, that's, this, that's different. But good, good try. No one remembers right now. Yes, the advice. What did he tell? bil ma'rufi, munkar, wasbir ala ma asabak. Did? Ya salam. Before he mentioned, when, when Luqman gave the advice, he began with the most important, the most significant, the most dangerous, the only unforgivable sin, in a sense that if you die upon it, you can never be forgiven, which is, la tushrik billah, do not associate partners with Allah. And today, this is one of the most critical subject matters in the life of a Muslim, that cannot be overemphasized. We, if we spent days and weeks and months and years giving workshops and studies and explaining to the people over and over again the significance of Tawheed and the dangers of Shirk, it would not be enough, Wallahi. It would not be enough. Because the Prophet wasallam spent how many years? 13 years doing just that. And even though he is the most eloquent وسلم, he had miracles backing him up. He split the moon, you know, he made water increase by, by putting his hand in it, alayhi salatu salam. He performed, you know, a number of miracles during his time. And yet you had people like Abu Jahl and Abu Lahab and so on and so forth. You had disbelievers, people that were plotting to kill him and so on and so forth. So in spite of the efficiency and the excellence of the da'wah of the Prophet Sallallahu who had the best reputation among his people before the prophethood. The end result was people insisted on shirk and rejected tawheed. And those who embraced tawheed, 
It took years of development and instillment in them before they were at a stage where they were able to face the rest of the world. In the beginning, they weren't expect even, even acts of worship, even the most important of acts of worship, they were not yet made obligatory until Tawheed was established. Alcohol was not prohibited from being consumed until the end of the prophethood, until the end of the life of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. Wow! Because they were priorities. And today our priorities are completely off track. They're completely lost. And not that long ago, we had a gathering here. And, I, and I'm still, it still hurts me. It hurts me deep inside that I asked a question about whether Allah Azza wa is angry or becomes angry. And we had a debate about it. It wasn't something that would, I would expect everybody, everybody with no exception would be on the same page. Everybody reads in the Fatiha, غير المغضوب عليهم, other than those who have attained your wrath. Therefore, Allah Azza wa Jal has wrath. You know, that's, 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 a, that's the ABCs of, of Islam. Yet, among people that care, Jazakumullah khair, I'm not here to put you down. You actually care. You're actually here. Don't ask about those right now who aren't, whether they know or not. You know what I mean? So, th just to be transparent, there's a lot of groundwork that has to be done. And so when it comes to priority, before we deal, about, deal with all the other matters, the first and most fundamental thing is to fix our relationship with Allah. And that cannot be fixed if you don't know who Allah is, and if you don't and avoid the things which leads to shirk and polytheism. Tayyib. Fourthly, you must identify your talents, skills, and abilities. People do it differently. You may be the type who needs to jot it down. You sit down, have a nice cup of coffee if you drink coffee, a cup of tea if you drink tea, juice if you want juice. Sit down and, and talk, have a talk with yourself. What am I capable? What are my areas of, you know, where I can enhance, improve, better myself? What are the things which are unique to me in a sense? Not unique that you're the only one in the dunya who has it, but this is something that can actually be Improved. What are your potentials in other ways? Write them down. It is important that you know them and then you consult people that know better about them and start and start the, the project of self-development in that direction. Example. To give you an example that you can relate to. Some people are good in designing. Designing different websites or designing flyers. They have that, that touch. And they may do it as a, you know, as a hobby on the side. But they're actually pretty good. They're actually pretty good. And then you see, you see for example, when, when non-Muslims or when there's a business venture or there's an event, you see a lot of effort, a lot of uh, you know, professionalism is, is put into this product. And when it comes to the Islamic objectives and the Islamic thing, it's always mashi halak. You know, we do it like, yani, barely getting there. Why? A question that we must ask ourselves, why? Do we not have enough qualified people? We do. For the, actually, you will find that the people who did these flyers or these events for the business are Muslims. It's probably Muslims who are that skilled and talented, mashallah, tabarakallah. But... It is not being channeled. It is not being channeled in the, right, in the right direction. So what is your area of specialty? You could be a person who uh, is good at, at authoring. You, you are a good writer. And you can write, you know, you can simplify complex matters to the people. Some people have that ability. The ability to simplify complicated matters. And you can write. People, you know, appreciate your writing skills. Then write. Then start, you know, buy a book about how to become a better writer. Take a course about how to become a better writer. Look, nowadays everything is online. And you don't have to say, oh, I have to travel all the way to Berlin to take a course. You don't have to do anything. It's online. It's probably online and probably affordable, if not free. Either it's free or it's affordable. Some, some peanuts, which you would, you know, pay to get a nice dinner. 
but you wouldn't pay an same amount of money for you to get a degree or certificate or to improve yourself in a certain area. You know why? Because we don't, we're not thinking actively like this. We're just kind of living on the, on the margin. But I ask you, please, for the sake of Allah, all of us, identify your skills, your talents, your capabilities, and then do something about it. Invest into this. Improve yourself. And always remember that you're doing this in the context of the needs of the Muslims. Don't go into a field where the only people that will benefit from you are the non-Muslims. And then the Muslims are sitting there watching like, hey, what about us? And you're like, sorry, this is not relevant. Think about something that is actually relevant. And if you want Allah's blessings, if you want Allah's facilitation, then whatever talent you have, invest some of it fi sabilillah. Don't be all about money. Don't be, you know, worldly oriented. Everything, everything is with a price. Doing something for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal will bless your efforts, will bless your learning, will bless your, your you know, whatever you're engaging in. So it's like almost like a, a, a tax for the blessing of Allah. It's like a zakah. That's why the scholars say zakatul ilm. Ilm has zakah. What is zakah? That you give it to the people. You can't withhold it from the people. If Allah gives a scholar knowledge, he can't just sleep at home. And similarly, if you have a skill that benefits the ummah, you can't just sleep at home. You have to give back. Fifthly, we have a, we have a disease. And a disease that begins with the three letters P-R-O Pro What do you think the d disease is? Who thinks it's professionalism? Is professionalism a disease? Did someone say yes so I can spill this coffee on my head? <laughs> professionalism is a disease Professionalism is a blessing We have to be professional In everything we do we can't be professional in everything we do because we're humans. But in terms of aiming, well, we aim for professionalism in every single occasion. So what could be the disease that begins with pro? Procrastination. Oh, okay, I see. And both of you said at the same time, yes. Procrastination. I know it's one of the most complicated English words. It just sounds like, it sounds like a paragraph, not even a word. And usually whoever said it back in the day sounded like they really know what they're talking about, you know? Even though they spent like two days repeating it until they got the pronunciation right. Procrastination. How many syllables is that? Who cares? Uh, procrastination is a, is a design. You know what it means? Procrastination is basically, as they say in Arabic, تأجيل عمل اليوم إلى الغد. Is that you put off and delay and postpone what you need to do now for some future time. Some day, one day, inshallah, I will do it. This happens a lot in the household, right? The husband has promised to fix the, you know, the flush and that for the last, you know, six months or the sink which has been leaking for the last six years. And then we have, we can, we can come up with hundreds of examples. You know, every day, like, I'll give you my example. We have a light bulb, a light bulb right in the entrance. I mean, how difficult it is when you're out and about a million times to stop and get a light bulb. It's a piece of cake. It's a two minute mission. And every day on the way out and on the way in, we're like, the light bulb. Yes, we need to change this light bulb. And it's procrastination, really, it's procrastination. It's just, I'll do it tomorrow, inshallah, tomorrow. If you had gone down right then and there, and the, the store is right next, it's walking distance from my house. If I were just say, okay, khalas, enough is enough. I would go down, buy it, come back, end of story, right? You now enjoy the light for six months instead of needing a light for six months. Ajib, yani humans are amazing. And so procrastination is, is a disaster. Now, when it's something mundane like a light bulb no one cares right i mean you still see inside the house it's not like you're falling into a pit in the house because there's no light alhamdulillah there are there are tiles but in in more important matters procrastination could be fatal procrastination could be deadly putting off things that should not be put off they need immediate attention immediate attention because the nature of procrastination is that you pile up. There's just a pile of things. Like laundry. You have one batch. You don't do it on time. Then you have another batch. Which you don't do on time. Next thing you know, you have a problem at home. You feel like you have the clothes of an army. A whole army. Even though it's like two kids. 
You just see like 25 shirts. I don't know how many shorts. And now, now the, the washing machine is crying. The dryer is crying. Everybody's like, what did I do? Why do I have to run for like seven hours straight to finish all these loads of laundry? Then how much folding do you have to do? Ask the sisters. Brothers, of course, some of you will relate. Most of you will not relate because you're the one just watching. It's like, yeah, that looks painful. May Allah make it easy for you. And some are kind, you know, say they and get involved. And then, of course, after you fold two shirts, they tell you, thank you very much that you've done enough damage. I appreciate the gesture. Now go back and, you know, get some rest. Because you don't have the same skills as a woman in folding. You just like put them together just so they, they look neat. So maybe I'm speaking about myself here. But it doesn't matter. Maybe you relate, maybe you don't. Long story short, next thing you know, laundry becomes like a, a really a painful experience. And you have stress. You start stressing over and the whole family is stressing because you simply didn't do laundry on time. That's just an example. And we have hundreds of those. Same thing applies to dishes. Same thing applies to schoolwork. For those who go to school, you don't do your homework on time or you don't study for this exam. Final exams come around, man, you're in trouble. You have so much to study now, so much to cover, so much to review. And then you start calling your friends. Hey, do you have the notes for that day because I missed class? Man, you find yourself in, in deep, deep trouble. Had you been on point? Had you been particular? Had you been pedantic about things and not procrastinated? You would have avoided a major disaster. Sixthly, do not resort to blind following. Don't just do what everybody else is doing. Have your own touch. Distinguish yourself from competition. Just because people are doing something, you don't have to ride that same wave and be in that same bandwagon. You don't have to do that. Have some individuality. Have some, you know, your own unique personality. Be different. Not just to be different, but in order to move, move forward. In order to move forward. Again, I ask the sisters to work with me, please. I know some of you might have something very important to discuss, but I'm genuinely being distracted. Wallah. Thank you so much. I'm not trying to be rude, but it's difficult for me to maintain. Because you're loud. I hear you, mashallah. I forgot what I was saying. Let's see the brothers. What was I saying? Now look at they see this is the, there's, there's a rule right there's a rule that the people in the front know what's going on and the people in the back not necessarily right if you ever attended training if you ever I mean I train part of my job my job is to actually train on products and whatever so whenever the people come for any training I already know from the seating what's you know to some degree what's coming next very rarely do people sit in the back they have a reason, some of them sit in the back because you know he's going to get a phone call, he has a personal reason, so he wants to be away from, from the distraction, which is praiseworthy. You know, they sit in the back on purpose, so if they need to go out and come in, maybe they have bathroom needs or whatever, they don't want to be distracted. And some people sit in the back because the back is where you're like low-key, and you just get to ch chillax. The people in the front are those who will often be grilled. And they'll be asked and they'll have to interact and they show more attention. So um, my, my advice to any one of you, if you ever attend any type of training, any type of lecture, even the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, we should sit close to each other and we should all sit, it should be in the front. And every single training I've attended, I, when I go to Korea, they have, we have this humongous auditorium and I have a seat that is reserved without my name on it. No one is surprised that this crazy guy, Wajdi, is always sitting in the same spot. It's my spot. And no one, will, no one sits there from among other, you know, Samsung employees. It's my spot. And because I sit there, I often get the most information, take the most notes, give the most feedback, have more access to products. Whenever they want to share something to see, I'm the first one who gets to inspect this new product before it's passed around. Sometimes the people in the back never get to see it. By the time it makes it to them, time is up, they call it off, tak tak tak, they're done. Sitting in the front always, always brings tremendous benefits. And it keeps you in check. You know, it keeps you on your toes because you know that you're, you're in the front. You have to be aware. So it helps you not fall asleep during the lecture. Anyways, I don't know why. This is part of actually self-development. If you know that you're that type and the brothers in the back right now want to hang me, I know. 
They're like, thank you for putting us on the spot, but I'm not trying to do that. I'm, I'm just saying as an advice for the future, sitting in the front is in your favor, inshallah, 99% of the time. Type. So we were speaking about um, not, rip, not blindly following anyone, have your own individuality, have your own touch so that you can distinguish yourself. And when you distinguish yourself, that kind of motivates you. When you have something that people don't have, that, that gives you that motivation to go further as opposed to you being at par and equal to everybody else. Seventhly, um, you have to pay attention to haters or haters, if I have to pronounce it in the traditional way. Who are haters? Who can identify haters? Who can give me a definition of a hater? Yes, brother? Negative people? All right. Jealous. Jealous? Okay. Um, it's people who actually uh, we get motivation from to develop our own. Ya salam alaik ya sheikh. The brother said people we get motivation from to better ourselves. That's very positive. I haven't heard that in a minute. Okay. So you, you look at those as means of betterment for your own self. That's interesting. Any other definitions? Are they, are they inevitable? Will there be a possibility that you will have only supporters and lovers and no haters? Impossible. Who had the most haters? Ironically, who had the most haters? Prophets. The prophets had the most haters you can think of. To the degree of people wanted to assassinate them. It's, it's one thing that a person doesn't like you. It's another thing that they reach upon where they say, no, we need this man dead. You understand? They, they wanted to kill them. And of course, they, in the process, they called them magicians, uh, liars, soothsayers, whatever. They called them all types of names, made all kinds of accusations against them. So haters are going to hate, as they say. This is a very common Western expression, I guess. And since we're speaking English and it's a Western language, nobody's going to be mad. Haters are going to hate because there's no way around it. There's absolutely no way around it. If you're going to let the haters get to you, and it depends on your level of sensitivity, then you will be missing out on the greater picture. Don't be distracted by haters because they will not cease to exist. They will always be around. Subhanallah. You get rid of one, another one comes around. And it's a never-ending journey. And so, if you look at them positively, as a brother had mentioned, that those are the people who, you know, he uses as a motivation because they say when you start having enemies you might be you must be doing something right especially when it comes to da'wah if everybody is in agreement with you something is wrong something is wrong too much sugar coating too much padding on the back you know too much water down watering down of the religion no doubt it doesn't work it doesn't work because the more you the more you try to preach the, the sound message which conflicts with people's des des desires the more you're going to have problems, no doubt and so we need to pay attention to that alright, so when it comes to the uh, issue of prioritizing when it comes to the issue of prioritizing what, what are the steps that one has to take effectively and we want to look at that in the context of spirituality what is the first thing we ought to do right now to start heading in the right direction? Who can give us a suggestion? If, if I say right now, okay, this lecture, let's say, is a starting point for, for each one of us to start working on a better version of himself. And I remember in, in the recent training I gave, uh, we, we, we had a video of what they call Paralympics. Does anyone know what Paralympics is? Olympics for the people that are paralyzed or disabled and if you watch this video they call them superhumans by the way Wallahi you'll be amazed ya akhi. you'll be amazed to see someone who has amputated legs or one amputated leg running track a, a race playing basketball swimming weightlifting people with an amputation one arm only one arm the other arm doesn't exist Weightlifting, doing things that us normal people, you know, people, alhamdulillah, that are sound in terms of physical ability, can't even come close to. And those people are at a level where they are participating in Olympics. 
and being honored and receiving medals and so on and so forth. You think, and all I could get from this lesson is what potential do we actually have? What potential do you have? If a person has been, you know, they've gone through some accident or they experienced an accident or some war which resulted in a permanent physical damage and that didn't stop them from not only continuing life but even excelling in life. Subhanallah, they actually excel. They use this as a reason to become better. Then what about me and you? What, what potential do you have that you are sleeping on? You will be amazed what you can do. You will be amazed what you can do. What's preventing us? A lot of things. The first thing that we ought, we ought to do is evaluate our relationship with Allah find out the loopholes and the problems and have an action plan immediately using upcoming Ramadan inshallah as that you know that phase of major improvement of acceleration so if I'm stepping on the gas what I'm already moving I'm already moving at a decent pace to get to my destination. When Ramadan comes, I'm going to go full speed, turbo mode. Turbo mode. But it has to start now. An evaluation of one's relationship with Allah and where are the loopholes. Trust me, you know. Yourself, I know myself. I don't think anyone is oblivious to where, our, where are we sinning and where we could be doing better, but we're just, we're handcuffed. That's the first thing. And that means that there has to be tawbah. That means there has to be a repentance. Once we identify the issues, then we need to repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from whatever shortcomings that we have. Thirdly, we need to have that session with ourselves or maybe consult loved ones, your spouse, your siblings, uh, people that your best friends, people that you trust. Let's sit down and talk about what do you think I'm, I'm capable of? What do you see as a unique feature in me? Something that I'm able to develop. Usually people that are close to you will not, will not front with you. They will not lie to you. They will give it to you bluntly. They will tell you. And sometimes you will doubt yourself. You say, seriously, I don't think I'm that good at that thing. They will tell you, trust me, you're good. You just don't know. Many times people will tell you that you're good at something that you yourself don't even know. You think you're okay. And they will tell you, no, you are great. Because we've seen A, B, C, D, we've seen many examples. We know that this is... So you get a reinforcement from someone that you don't expect. Something that you yourself didn't think you were special at. Consult people. Have a self-evaluation. Identify your talents and potential. And then put a schedule together. Have a schedule where, that requires of you attention, uh, it requires of you that you comply and you act according to a plan. Don't work it randomly. Don't take it as it comes. Have a roadmap and have different points of, of where, you, where you appreciate your own effort. What is useful in this regard is self-reward. You know what self-rewarding is? Meaning once you've put a plan, a roadmap, in other words... Every time you meet an objective, award yourself. Go out and buy yourself something. Go have dinner with someone that is dear to you. You know, make it a special moment. Don't, don't let all these efforts of yours go unnoticed. And for those who are supporting you, they should support you as well. If they know that you've reached a certain point, they should create an event where they, you know, they make you feel special. This is motivational. Not to take away from sincerity, of course. Not so that this becomes a show for the people. A'udhu Billah. But it is, it is rewarding. It is helpful that you have that kind of support. Either you support yourself or you get the support from others. <coughs> and then have a checklist. Whatever you accomplish, take it off on that list of things. Because there should be a date of revision. I had targeted to do X amount of things by this date and I am falling short on one, two, three items. You should have a plan, a counter plan 
for the things that you did not achieve and why? What prevented you? You might modify your plan, you might modify your schedule based on the reality because sometimes you have, you put an expectation that you yourself you're not able to meet. And then of course, lastly, I want to, to mention this in the light of Ramadan. Again, once again, we don't know. Every year we say this and every year we happen to be alive Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen But we honestly don't know when it will be our last Ramadan You hear this every year And you know it applies to some people It doesn't apply to others But it applies to people And we don't know when our turn is going to be next So please let's, let's do this plan For Ramadan And let's make Ramadan one that is uniquely Different than all our previous years Let's have the niyyah from now. And I remember Sheikh Muhammad Shankit rahimahullah or hafidahullah, he mentioned that. He mentioned that you must have the intention way before Ramadan. The, the Sahaba used to prepare for Ramadan how many months before Ramadan? Six months, yes, Sheikh. Six months before Ramadan. Six months. We, we prepare six minutes before Ramadan. Six seconds before Ramadan. Oh, it's Ramadan? Oh, okay, alhamdulillah. I'm fasting tomorrow. Six months they prepare. If you intend from now, if you have this niyyah and you die before Allah will give you the reward of your niyyah. Whatever you intended to do is already given to you. Versus not having this niyyah, you get nothing. You will get nothing at all. So the, the plan, the action begins today. We start accelerating slowly but surely, go from first gear to second gear, to third gear, when Ramadan comes, we will be in turbo mode. Inshallah. And Ramadan has always been such a blessing for the believer that for many people it's a life-changing event. Ramadan is often that point where you're able to do some serious changes into your life. Way more successfully than the rest of the year. More shayateen are, are chained more desire to do good, facilitation from Allah, it's a perfect opportunity to go that extra mile and push ourselves to become better people in Ramadan and better people after Ramadan. So know what your talents are, start working on it, consult with people and let us all work together to have a better version of ourselves, seeking Allah's pleasure, being sincere to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you don't get to achieve your objectives in this life, you will see their fruits in the life to come. And that is sufficient for a believer. Hada wallahu alam wa sallallahu wa sallam alameen Muhammad. Zakum la khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. If you have any questions, you may ask uh, directly or through paper or however means you find useful for you. And uh, for the sisters, if you want to send some of the questions on. Uh, on the group, if it makes it easier for you, that's also an option, inshallah. Brothers, any questions? You don't have to invent one if there's no question, by the way. Some people start thinking, let me think of a question now. No, no, either you have a question or you don't. Because usually the questions that you come up with on the spot are the most difficult to answer. Because they're like not real. How often do I give English lectures? A very good question. It, it, the frequency changed throughout the years, depending on my my work uh, requirements. Um, so we used to have the lectures at some point. Oh, forget about the past. In recent times, because of IMC, we used to have them at least once a month, unless I'm traveling or whatever. But IMC stopped the having religious events in the in their location, and so now. In Saudi Arabia, the only time there's an English lecture is at Jeddah Center. And they arrange it here monthly. 
But then it doesn't have to be me every month. They have different speakers. So every now and then, you know, it might be my turn. Then we have a khutbah in English at the Mushrifa Da'wah Center on Sabin Street. Khutbah, the actual khutbah in English. It, it, what is, what's the name of it? It's called Islamic Research Foundation. Yeah, I, okay. So you had it yesterday. No, I was in the khatib. Yes, they have it every Friday. Every Friday, the khutbah is in English. I mean, it's an official khutbah just like any other masjid. But it's in English. It's pretty good, inshallah. So, maybe once a month, twice a month, it'll be my turn. So it's either there or here. But if you're looking for content, alhamdulillah, bifadullah azza wa jal, on YouTube, there are maybe hundreds. What I mean, did, like, I've, it's the first time I've heard an English lecture in Saudi in four years. I, yeah, I hear you. If you, know, once you connect with, with what's going on here, they, they have... Even other da'wah centers are having lectures every now and then. The, the same da'wah center where the khutbah is, they are also holding lectures you know, on certain days, on Saturdays, I think. So you'll find, you'll, you'll find a lot of activity. Not as much as before. Things are changing here nowadays. There is a demand. Yes, sir. Yes. Um, are, you, are you familiar with Window? The Western Nationality Da'wah Organization. Okay, they, they had a istiraha just recently. Uh, so they, they rent out this kind of istiraha, yeah. Yeah, and they had the whole thing with sports and uh, Asim al-Hakim gave a talk over there. So they're, now they're starting to work more consistently. I'll give you their link or maybe one of the brothers will give you the link, inshallah, and you'll have plenty of things to do, inshallah. Right? Yes, it's only for the Westerners. Uh, it's pre I mean, because if you say it's going to be for English-speaking people, then the, the list is never-ending. And they don't have, it's, it's budgeted, meaning they go to some guy who's going to say, look, we have these people from these countries and what have you, they donate money. If, if they're going to invite everybody who speaks English, so now you have a hu humongous event. They just can't afford it. So the way it's always worked is like, you know, they have the Indian community, the Filipino community, then the Western community, even though English is a common denominator, still, yeah. it's targeting people of native, of that, basically, I don't belong there. Technically speaking, I don't belong there. I shouldn't go there. And last time I went and left, I'm Lebanese, so I have nothing to do with it. And so even I, in, in some way, I, unless I was involved in Dawah, I wouldn't be there either. So sometimes I just get by because I, I, I give lectures, that's all. Yes? As an Arab, it is preferred that you don't. I would say if, if you're an Arab, because of course fundamentally speaking, you, once you understand the language, then the, you should be in an Arab. The only, the only time I would advise you otherwise is if, that if you're in your neighborhood, the, the quality of the khutbah is poor, and you believe you will benefit more in English, then that's another story. Like personally, personally, a khatib who reads a khutbah from the mimbar, from a piece of paper, I, I will not attend. I don't need someone who, who prints a khutbah from the internet and reads it from the mimbar. Either you are a khatib, so you're qualified, you've done your homework, you've prepared, you know, you may read, you may refer to some evidences, but you're... You're speaking to the people or any, any Joe can pick up a piece of paper and put on a shemagh and get on a member and, and read. And it's, it's just monotone and boring and you see people falling asleep. So if this is what you're experiencing and you believe that the khutbah in English is a little bit more interactive and more beneficial, then you, you go where the benefit is. Now. Assalamualaikum. How are you? What's going on in the back? All this and not even a single question has made it. All right, here comes the essays. Seriously? MashaAllah. All right, question number one. Salam alaikum, alaikum salam, rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Is it a sin? All right, sisters, sisters. Please work with me. Jazakumullah khair. Is it a sin to not use our talents and abilities in da'wah if we fear show off? Or if it might be harmful for our iman? No, it is not a sin. If you think, if you have the disease of 
wanting to show off and you're unable to manage it and you avoid it for that purpose, you're not sinful but you're definitely giving in. You consider it to be someone who surrendered to the shaitan. And so what we're taught by the scholars is whenever you are fearing showing off, you have two choices. Either because of that you abandon good or you do good and you rectify your intention. And what you're supposed to do is do, continue to do good and just fix your intention. Don't let that be a me because the shaitan ultimately wants to prevent good. So he's going to play with you on this issue of, oh, you're showing off, you're a show off, you're seeking reputation. Accordingly, you won't do anything. He wins. He wins. No, do it, do it and, and fix your intention for the sake of Allah. When you get these whispers, don't entertain them. Don't entertain them. Just dismiss them and continue to do. Trust me, everyone who gives khutbah, Everyone who gives a lecture, you know how many times, how many times throughout the lecture the shaitan tries to get into your head? If every time he tries to get into your head, you're going to say, you know what, let me go home. Then, then nothing gets done. He gets the ideas, man, get out of here, man. You know, just get out of here. I'm not trying to hear you. Khalas. Allah knows. Allah Azza knows that you, you fought it. It's not like you're going to go into a, a ring and, you know, have a knockout session with the shaitan. It's just a matter of, Fighting off this idea, forget about showing off. This is, this is for my akhirah. Allah is watching, I'm trying to please Allah. Forget about the people. Simple as that. Don't, don't let the shaitan distract you from the better, uh, from the better objectives. Are we allowed to aid, yes yeah, sisters. Are we allowed to aid non-Muslims if they are in a very bad situation and they look up to you? It could be a source of da'wah. Of course. Subhanallah, of course you're allowed. Why would you not be allowed? In fact, it could be obligatory. It's a human being. There's a level of humanity that Islam acknowledges. You differentiate between loving and hating for the sake of Allah and between being kind to people in general, as the Prophet ﷺ was. So of course it is allowed. I work with converts, help them settle, and sometimes I came across cases of um, homosexual people seeking help from me because of some suffering uh, suffering, or because someone referred them to me. Is it wrong to aid them? Uh -huh. Now that's a whole other story. You don't want to aid them in a sense that you're helping them remain who they are. Zakallah khair. Shukran Jameel. You don't want to help them in, in remaining or in continuing in their evil path. There's a difference. So now really it depends on what type of help do they need from you. If you're able to influence them positively as means to give them da'wah and perhaps bring them out of the darkness to the light, by all means. If your aid is one wherein you are empowering them to continue to be the way they are, then of course not. Because Allah says, وَتَعَاوَنُ عَلَى الْبِرِّ وَالتَّقْوَى وَلَا تَعَاوَنُ عَلَى الْإِثْمِ وَالْعُدْوَانِ Aid one another in righteousness and fear of Allah and do not aid one another in sinfulness and transgression and fear Allah so you have to be very careful what type of assistance are you providing these people uh, please share these links with everybody productive uh, okay well I cannot share the the links may Allah bless you until I investigate them myself and of course, I cannot read a whole link to the people with HTTP colon, you know, semicolon or whatever you call it, the slash slash. That's like a whole, that's a lecture on its own. So um, I want to check those out first and make sure that they're sound. And then once we do so, then maybe we can uh, have an email group or we can have some means of sharing with you the actual links. Because the link itself is, is a long story. Uh, for lit. Okay, for ladies with uh, nursing babies, small children, how can we do ibadah in Ramadan? Will taking care of the babies considered ibadah because taraweeh ibadah is difficult? Anything which you do for the sake of Allah can turn into ibadah. For the, for the case of the women or any woman, uh, any woman who in Ramadan is prevented from doing any ibadah because of her natural condition, whether whatever Allah had decreed for her in terms of the you know, monthly cycle or because of pregnancy or because of nursing, whatever the case may be, as long as you have the intention to do good, Allah will give you that good. And then you go to the next best thing. So you're unable to go to the masjid to do taraweeh, you're unable to fast, you do the next best thing, whatever else you can do that, you know, for example, nursing doesn't conflict with reading the Quran. So you read more Quran. 
And you, you, don't be, you don't become completely lazy because of the excuse of not being able to do certain acts of worship. At the same time, Allah is merciful and generous. Rest assured that you will not, we, your efforts will not be gone or wasted if you have the proper intentions. Is drawing haram? No. Drawing in and of itself is not haram. But what you draw determines whether it is halal or haram. If you're drawing any animate objects, if it's human beings or animals that have souls, and you're drawing them as Allah created them, not some imaginary character, then it's haram. And if you're drawing, you know, other, other creations of Allah, like the sun or the moon or the plants or you know, whatever, universe or house or whatever, all that is fine. Just don't draw animate objects, don't draw soul possessors. And that's where the prohibition is. Otherwise, you can draw whatever you like to draw. What's the meaning of life? Seriously? Ah, okay. The, well, the, how do I answer that? What's the meaning of life? That's a deep question. Wait a second. Well, the meaning of life, I, I don't know. I, I have a lecture on this. You know what? I have a lecture titled, Why? Okay, just go on YouTube and put my name, Wajdi Akari or Abu Musa Wajdi Akari, and then why? And the lecture speaks about the purpose of life. But you know, the meaning of life is you're a creation of Allah and you will return to Him and you've been given this time in order to prepare for that journey and then that ultimate destination. So make sure that you have all of the tools and the means necessary to reach your destination safely. I don't know if that does it, but that's the meaning of life according to my understanding. Can I give zakat to a friend who is in need because her husband is in prison and she has three children left with her? You better believe that it is okay to give her zakat. If she, she falls under miskeen or faqir. And the scholars, by the way, when they define miskeen and faqir, they don't look at someone who is flat out broke. As in someone who doesn't have a nail, doesn't even have a, a, a halala. Someone who has an income but doesn't meet their needs to survival is actually someone who is a miskeen. So a person could have some money but that money doesn't suffice for their survival. That person is still entitled to receive zakah. So yes, inshallah, you may give zakah to a person of this, uh, in that condition. Oh, the other papers were blank. So maybe by mistake, the sister sent the other blank papers. Now you're looking for them. I have them. So no more questions for you. No, I'm just... Somebody give it back to the sisters, please. Zakal khair. Any other questions? Otherwise, we'll call it a day. Yes, brother. How to encourage children to pray on a regular basis by instilling that in them from a young age. So the, it begins with the early stages. Now, if they're under seven years old, according to many of the scholars, you're not even allowed to force them to pray. If the child has not reached the age of seven, you may not tell him, you must pray with me. You might not even tell him that. However, children tend to copy. So you find that the children will have that kind of motivation on their own to go with you to the masjid or whatever you use that interest that they have to train them on how to pray um, and children generally are however you mold them so how to encourage them is by teaching them fundamentals of tawheed that why we created what we're doing here why is salah important for them why they need that connection with their lord as they become older we're living in in wilderness nowadays and if you don't have that right bond with Allah, you will get lost in, in, the, in the ocean. So it's almost like the boat that keeps you afloat. It keeps you surviving in, in the midst of the, all the craziness that we're living in. So, you know, you, you, uh, you use, of course, children language to deliver that information. And inshallah ta'ala, most kids, you know, will comply. They will be more than happy to comply. It's consistency. Resist. At what age? You have to force them. 
the Prophet ﷺ said, you know, وَضْرِبُوهُمْ عَلَيْهَا وَهُمْ أَبْنَاءُ عَشْرِ You may have to use physical. Of course, you don't go to a child and send him to the hospital. You know, they go visit him, they see him, his leg is hanging from the ceiling. Well, what happened? Well, I didn't pray, my father taught me a lesson. That's not what is intended. But it means that you take the matter a little bit more seriously, you have more commitment. And so, no, you have to make them pray. Um, of course, look, if you're forcing them to pray without spiritually preparing them is, is fruitless to some degree. So it's important that they go through the right teaching. If, if the father himself is unable to deliver the message, then he must use external elements. He must use other people. Maybe he's not, he's not efficient. He's not eloquent enough. He's not, he cannot articulate to the children the message. That's why you have a Muslim community. And so you get other people involved who can sit down and have a talk and you never, subhanAllah, that talk can go a long way with the child. Sometimes the child has a resistance from his own father that he doesn't have from someone else for whatever other reasons, for whatever reasons between them. But the father has to use all means possible to make sure that the children are praying. It's, it's not an optional matter. Yes, sheikh. Yes, not a sheikh. Yes, tfaddal. Uh, could you provide us with ideal strategies in order to adopt for the haters, how to deal with the haters? Yeah, look, I struggle with haters myself. So I, I'm not going to pretend that I have a full-fledged plan. Uh, but what people advise me, and I need to act upon the advice, is ignore. The best, the, the best cure for them is to ignore. How much can you ignore that, that differs from a person to another? Ignore is not enough. The next step. If you ignore them is not enough, then you ignore them again. I mean, I don't know what to tell you. I'm not going to tell you to take matters into your own hand. But, you know, how much retaliation, how much energy is it going to take from you to retaliate? Allahu A'lam. It's difficult to give you a plan. Fundamentally, you don't want to give them attention because they feed off your attention. You might give them some attention in the beginning. At some point, you just have to say, you know, you give up on the whole matter. That's really the, the only way out. It, it takes a lot of patience. Honestly, it takes a lot of patience and perseverance and facilitation from Allah. But that's the plan. Naam, tawadha l'khi. For children. Yes, sir. Um, how to help a child understand how to use technology in the best of their, in the, in the best way instead of, and, and understand how it can become an addiction. Uh, again, repeat the question. You know, as parents. Yes, sir. We can monitor our children and say, look, you're becoming addicted to this. Yes, sir. But how do we get the child to understand? It's a challenge that we all face. It's a challenge that we all face. And, uh, you know, technology in general and all these gadgets and, you know, telecommunication tools and social media, all of this is, is consuming. Um, and so how are you going to explain to the children is by, by having talks with them. And by, of course, one part of it is going to be where you, you create the law, in a sense. You have a law that, that you adhere to, they adhere to. And then you, you have to address this issue. I understand that. I mean, I'm more so looking from an Islamic perspective. You know, um, miscibility, time, you know, uh, usage, things like that. I understand how to yeah. limit the time. <laughs> you know, I mean, I understand how to limit the government, but I mean... How, what, would you, what advice would you give from, from, from uh, I understand. It's about, it's about really if all of us, let's just say all of us have to uh, reconsider our priorities. So we often fall into this trap because our focus is on the dunya more than the akhira, which is the ultimate disease. So the ultimate disease is over indulgence and worldly matter. If we were to focus on the life to come, then we will find that we have really little time for these other things. But because we're not actively engaged in those priorities, we find ourselves with plenty of time to even discuss this. So if it, it's, a, it's a lot of work for the parent uh, because the parent has to have rectified themselves before they can rectify the children. Because if the parents are not on that page, then it's difficult to get the children on that page. So it begins with the parent seriously re, yeah, focusing on what's important and so whatever time they have, say we're going to use it for some Islamic discussions, to have a talk with each other, to learn a book together. When you do plenty of that, you will have little time left for gaming and having fun. And that would be in moderation. When nothing of that sort is being done, 
then you have a lot more time and it's a lot more challenging to try to convince everyone to slow down and mellow down when, when there's no other, there's no uh, plan B or there's no alternative. So creating that alternative will, will make it much easier to manage. Wallahu alam. A question from the sisters. You mentioned specializing in something. Is it okay to start many projects and leave to others in order to get the barakah? Uh, yeah, if, if that's something that the people will actually take and finish, why not? That may be relevant to some people, not relevant to others. Uh, for self-development to begin, it seems a person needs to uh, good self-esteem. How can a person build self-esteem for themselves, uh, for, their self, for themselves and kids? What dua or things can be done? Um, I don't know of any particular dua for self-esteem. Um, and maybe this is a, a, a psychological you know, question to some degree and requires a psychological reply and this is not my field of expertise in any way, shape or form. Um, you know, I've always, I'm, I'm a believer in, in uh, you know, decision making. You, you make a decision and you enforce it upon yourself. I, I'm a believer that you can do, if there's a will, there's a way. I know a lot of people face issues with that. Uh, it's not as easy. They say you make it sound easy. It's not as easy. I can do it. But that's the only way I know that if you decide to have self-confidence, if you decide to fix yourself, if you decide to work on yourself and you seek Allah's aid, you can do it. Nothing can stop you. The only one that stops you is you not believing in yourself. So how to build self-esteem is, is something that may have different answers. You want to add something to it? Uh -huh. From the adhkar and the, of the sabah and the masa also, right? Would you like to translate that? It's actually one of the adayah of the Prophet ﷺ, general dua, which is relevant to the subject matter. Oh Allah, I seek refuge with you from uh, stress and laziness and from inability. Al-ajz and the inability. So it's, it's, uh, that's a general dua, Zakallah khair. Zakallah khair. That's a relevant dua to, to make uh, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in regards to this uh, issue. And then, you know, just basically, just do it. I know this is not Nike, but honestly, just do it. Just don't, don't let the shaitan make you feel that you're unable to do something. You're only unable to do what you, what you make yourself believe you're unable to do. If you want to do it, you can do it, inshallah. Now, any other questions? Looks like it's a wrap. Oh, never mind. Any other questions? Sisters, are you still writing or you're done? You could, if you're still writing something, you can uh, let me know so that I'll wait. And if you're done, so I, we won't just be waiting for nothingness. Thank you, sir. What is the best way to cope with all the Muslim suffering around us? and all the darkness? That's a good question. Um, by knowing that you merely feeling sorry for them is useless. Because it doesn't fix anything. I don't know if you know the difference between sympathy and empathy. Right? Uh, and According to some of the definitions of those involved in this field, empathy is, is when you feel with someone and that feeling generates an action. So if we were to, one way of looking at the difference between sympathy and empathy, and I'm not saying this is agreed upon by everybody, but this is one opinion. Sympathy is that you see a beggar and you feel sorry for him. Empathy is that you see a beggar, you feel sorry for him, so you give him some money. All right? And so empathy in the case of believers is that not only you sit there and cry over them or you make a post on Facebook that the Muslims in Syria are suffering or in this country are suffering or in that country are suffering and then you're sitting there doing absolutely nothing about it. Empathy is actually that you do something about it. Now the question remains is, oh, what do I do about it? What am I supposed to do about it? Something that all you have to do is promote the information or send money or make dua. And that is true and false. Because that is one thing that you can do. What is more important than that is that you start working on the future of the ummah. You start putting down the bricks. 
you start placing the foundation upon which the coming generation will be able to overcome these problems. And that begins with yourself, wife, kids, people around you. So one way to deal with this issue, okay, the Muslims are suffering in Syria. Right now, what are the things, what are the options available to you? The fanatics and the, the, you know, the people that are military in their mentality will tell you, pick up arms and go over there. That is not a solution. It has proven to be unsuccessful. There's no, uh, uh, there's no Islamic guideline for this. It is not supported by the narrations of the Prophet ﷺ, how they did things. And it falls into an area of spilling blood, which is the last place you want to be in your, in your life. The last area, the last point of danger. And the end result is just more, more, de more casualties. You're not going to change it. It's not going to change. That's not what the Ummah needs. And those people are a lot. And the others, the others are those who just make dua. And how long have we been making dua for the people in Syria every Jum'ah, every Ramadan, every Taraweeh? For years. For years. And Allah Azza wa Jal is Samir. Mujibu dua. He's the all hearing, the one who responds to the dua. But Allah also made preventives. Things that prevent the dua from being answered. And what are those things? Is our abandonment of the deen in general. In tansurullah yansurkum. If you aid the deen of Allah, Allah will aid you. So we have to work on preparing this ummah to be back on track, removing all these bid'ah and all the shirk and all the problems that the ummah is suffering from, inviting people back to tawheed, building this foundation, then Allah Azza wa Jal Himself will bring about victory for the believers. It's from Allah, not through our hands. But doing the shortcut way doesn't work. Doesn't work. We've tried all the shortcuts in the world. All of them continue to fail. Nobody wants to take the long path. The long path which the Prophet ﷺ took with the Sahaba. That is building the foundation upon Tawheed. So that's how. You start working on yourself. You start learning Islam from scratch. You start implementing Islam in your family, in your household, among your relatives. You start better, bettering the community. And then when we do this, then there will be this kind of collaboration between the Muslims worldwide. Allah Azza wa Jal will facilitate the affairs of the Ummah. Until then... Don't expect any change. That's already been foretold by the Prophet ﷺ. We will continue to suffer until we go back to the deen. So what, excuse me, what's next is go back to the deen. That's what you can do inshallah. I'll take that as a no. So once again, Zakum Lakhir for coming out and sharing and attending and participating, making this uh, inshallah successful, I hope. And pray that Allah Azza will make it beneficial for me and for you. And make us among those who listen to the reminder and follow the best of it. Zakum la khair. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik. Shadu Allah ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka tu bulaik. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.